Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, it's great to be with you. My name is Richard. If you don't know who I am, if you're joining the service uh, as a, a first-time guest, uh, welcome, a special to you, uh, to my Every Nation family, if you're gathering together in an in-home worship setting, um, it's great that you're doing that together, and uh, as we continue in our counterculture series, um, it's, yeah, four Sundays to Christmas, uh, traditionally Advent starts four Sundays out from Christmas, and so we're, uh, we're in the final stages of our, of our fall teaching series, counterculture, next Sunday as we're back in person at Innes, uh, Lucas, Dr. Lucas Massiel will be finishing off our series, and so I would encourage you, we only have two more in-person services uh, next Sunday and then one just before Christmas, so do all that you can to be there, to join together, and so we're going to be um, closing out the series then. All right, so today we're going to be jumping in and we're looking and continuing in this counterculture series if we look at the the way, the attitudes, and the virtues, and the values that Jesus wants us to cultivate, um, a Christ-likeness that we're thinking, behaving, acting in ways that are Christ-like, and all the things that work against that, all the things externally, but also all the things internally that work against that. And so we've been looking at Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit of Christ that's in us, that's wanting to produce these kinds of characteristics. And so join me in reading this together. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, and gentleness is where we're going to be parked today. And so just to remind us, as we've been going through this series, and even as you're taking this in uh, on a screen somewhere, that um, information is important. Information is what we learn and know. But information really doesn't grow us in the way that we're meant to if it's not leading to formation. Formation is what we practice and do which leads then to transformation. That's what God does. He changes us. He takes our efforts, our um, making ourselves available to Him, and He changes us. He produces His fruit in and through our lives, but it is a partnership. And so I do want to encourage you as we've gone through this series that we can have a nice knowledge about love, joy, peace, patience, even today gentleness, but it's in the practicing and doing it and sometimes in the failing it that we grow. And so failure in that sense isn't to be seen as... Um, terminal, it's actually a sign that you're growing, that you're trying to become more like Jesus in these ways. And so you think about in in almost all other facets of life, in in school or work, there's there's markers that gauge how we're progressing. We go from one grade to another. We go from one uh, promotion or responsibility to another in our career and so on and so forth. And sometimes in in in, in our spiritual transformation and progression, it's hard to know what markers are we growing. And so the fruit of the Spirit are great and helpful markers along the way of following Jesus. Am I growing more in love for God and others as displayed by my peace, joy, patience, gentleness, faithfulness, kindness, all the things that we've been looking at. And so today we're going to be looking at what love for God and others looks like uh, in terms of a gentleness of character. Now, gentleness is um, perhaps in your Bible maybe um, uh, interpreted in different ways. Gentleness, mildness, Meekness or humility or, or substitute sometimes for this word gentleness. And, and in some ways, as it was then, as it is now, it's kind of mixed. In some ways, it's praised um, to have humility, to have a sense of meekness. But also in some cultures, it's also disdained. It's, it's seen as weakness. It's seen as timidity. Gentleness is seen as a weakness, particularly, I guess, sometimes in, in, in a male makeup in some cultures. And so um, in, in the time of Christ, in the time of their writing, what was often praised and, and seen as really strong virtues is strength, power, even boasting was actually seen as a virtue. And so these kind of things sometimes uh, come into clashing with things like gentleness. But What we want to ask today is we want to say, was how does Scripture define gentleness for us? When we're talking about the gentleness of Jesus, what does that mean? How does that look like in our lives? And so we're going to jump into that today. So as we're thinking about gentleness, as we're thinking biblically about gentleness, it really has two senses. And the first sense is a posture. It's a posture, ultimately before God and even within ourselves. It's a posture of meekness and humility before God and self. The humility is that we're not overly impressed with our own self-importance, right? Um, I think of often, um, you know, that I think, I think it's sometimes attributed to Lewis. I'm not sure if it actually was a C.S. Lewis quote, but he says, humility is not thinking less of yourself, 
but thinking of yourself less. And so there's a, there's a, a distinction there because sometimes the counterfeit to meekness and humility is a sense of inferiority, a, an, uh, an unhealthy self-consciousness, and that's not what we want today. But not only is it a posture, it's an act. It's an act of restraint. Gentleness is seen as an act of restraint, uh, particularly in strength and power for the benefit of another, and consideration, considering thinking about others more so than we're thinking about ourselves. Now, I don't know what comes to mind when you hear the word gentleness, but some images or some illustrations might be helpful in, in terms of capturing what we're talking about, more so there's these acts of restraint. And so we see, um, if you think about uh, parents with a newborn child, you think about all the strength, the physical strength and authority and power that a parent has, and yet in gentleness cradles that newborn infant. And as they grow up, cradles that child and lets them grow and nurtures them in acts of restraint. Uh, physically would be overwhelming for a baby. Um, so we also see it in handling something fragile. If you're carrying a vase, a glass, or an animal like a butterfly, we see gentleness in the sense that you could very easily do damage, cruelty to the thing of fragile in your hands, but gentleness is an act of restraint, a consideration for that which is loved, that which is, uh, has your uh, affection. And then the last thing, if you're like me, every time you go to the dentist, they're always telling you to brush a little gentler. Was that just me? And so there's a restraint of power and strength that we need to have in, in my brushing um, that's better for me. And so this gentleness, this posture, a posture and attitude of of meekness and humility as I think about God and who God is, as, as I think about myself in relation to God, and then it flows out in acts of restraint and deep consideration for others, and particularly as we get into the story of Jesus, particularly those that are vulnerable, marginalized. Um, and so the opposite of, of gentleness, the opposite of what we're talking about would be a posture of superiority, of arrogance, a self-absorption and leading to acts of being harsh with people, being rough with people, even being cruel to people. And so um, as we've been going throughout this series, and really as a pattern has emerged, as we almost always turn to how is this being embodied in Jesus. And there's a really good reason for that, because Christianity at its essence is a reciprocal relationship in the sense that we need to encounter something of the gentleness of Jesus first towards us before we're going to have any hope of seeing it being cultivated and embodied in our lives. Otherwise, it's just going to be a work of Richard's gentleness, which has its limitations, or your work. And so we're going to start here. We're going to look at what does Jesus and gentleness look like. And so um, a very you know, famous passage is, comes from Matthew 11, and a very key passage as we look about this. Jesus says this. He says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When Scripture talks about the heart, they're talking about the core of who you are, what defines you and directs you. It's not just a part of you. It's the core, the essence of who you are. And in a very rare moment, does Jesus actually come out and plainly say, this is who I am at the core? He's describing who he is at his core. Now, he's not just that. Obviously, we know he's more than that. But it's very interesting that he chooses gentle and, and humble or gentle and lowly uh, as a way to define who he is, the essence of it. In his incredibly popular book, and it's interesting that it's become so popular, Gentle and Lowly, uh, Dane Ortland examines this scripture, and he says it like this. In the one place in the Bible where the Son of God pulls back the veil and lets us peer way down into the core of who he is, we are not told that he is austere and demanding in heart. We are not told that he is exalted and dignified in heart. We're not even told that he is joyful and generous in heart. Letting Jesus set the terms, his surprising claim is that he is gentle and lowly in heart. Now, if you're watching and maybe you're seeking, maybe you're not sure if you'd call yourself a Christian, maybe you're not even sure what to make of Jesus, you know him as a historical figure, but was he really truly God? Um, and so here's a great place to start because Jesus is introducing himself as clearly as he can to you 
and I. He's opening up and the veil of who he is on the core. And at his core, he is gentle and humble. In other words, he's approachable. He's understanding. He's kind. And it's combined with his tender strength and his restraint of his obvious power and status. Dan Ortland goes on to say this, meek, humble, gentle. Jesus is not trigger happy, not harsh, reactionary, easily exasperated. He is the most understanding person in the universe. The posture most natural to him is not a pointed finger, but open arms. What a visual. What a visual. And again, if you're new to faith or you're exploring faith, sometimes maybe you can get the the idea, the concept that God or religion is about a pointed finger, a pointed finger of what you should be doing, what you aren't doing, where you messed up. And uh, I think Jesus is rewriting those scripts. He's approachable. Now, again, he is more things. We know that he is tremendously um, holy and deeply guards the truth, but his gentleness comes through in even those acts towards us. And so how do we see this in Jesus' life? How does he exemplify it throughout his life and his ministry? And if you read any stretch of the Gospels, you'll see the life and ministry of Jesus. You'll see how gentleness comes out in his interaction with people all the time. How he interacts with the outcasts, the marginalized, the vulnerable of his day. How he embraces uh, little children. How he interacts with women, um, you know, Two classes of citizenship that were seen as less than uh, in his time. Those seeking out miracles, those desperate in situations. Um, Even his disciples and often their displays of ignorance and arrogance. How he works with them, is, is gentle with them. Even in rebuking them, his gentleness comes through. And probably one of the clearest ways that we can see just how countercultural Jesus is with all his status as the Son of God is just the week before he goes to the cross, he arrives in Jerusalem, and he's, they're ready to install him as king, the king of the nation of Israel. He gets a king's welcome. And it says this in Matthew 21, 5, Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the fall of a donkey. It's not typically how kings or conquerors would arrive uh, in his time, it was often they're boasting, look how good I am, look at all the victory I have. And Jesus, we see, is defined by coming in as a conquering king in his gentleness. And so, if you look quickly at Jesus, we just see he is a model uh, for biblical gentleness. His meekness, his humility, his restraint, his consideration for the person that was standing before him or the crowds that were clamoring for him. And so now let's then begin to look at that and then see how it began to outwork in his immediate followers in the the first church um, outside of him. And so let's look quickly at the church and gentleness. And I'm going to, you know, just lock yourself in. We're going to rush through a bunch of scriptures that that speak about gentleness. But following in Jesus' footsteps, um, you know, arguably one of the next most famous people uh, is the Apostle Paul and his dramatic conversion from being a persecutor of the follower of Jesus to being a follower of Jesus himself. He re- clearly recognized the importance of uh, imitating Jesus' gentleness. Second Corinthians 10 says, By the humility and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you. There's many ways that we can appeal to one another. He says, By the humility and gentleness of Christ. You know, Paul went, if you know a little bit anything about his story, he went from being very zealous for God you know, persecuting the church, thinking he was doing uh, the right thing before God, sincere but sincerely wrong in that instance. And it says that he was consumed with zeal. Then he encounters Jesus. Um, and he encounters the fullness of who Jesus is and encounters the gentleness of Jesus towards him. And it changes Paul. Uh, and it changes him from being driven by zeal to be driven by love. And so, and gentleness is an outworking of love. And as he comes to a tricky situation, a tricky church in his time, Paul, he had planted this church and they kind of gone off the rails a bit. He says it like this, what do you prefer? Shall I come to you with a rod of discipline or shall I come in love and with a gentle spirit? I think Paul understands that, yes, he could come in with a rod of discipline in this situation. It called for some discipline, but probably wouldn't bear the fruit uh, that if he came in a different spirit, that if he came in, no doubt, gentleness doesn't shy away from truth. We're going to come to that. But he said he's going to come with a different spirit, with a gentle, with a loving 
spirit. Let's go on. He exhorted the Christians. Paul exhorted the Christians in Ephesus. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient. Bearing with one another in love. Listen to his encouragement to the Philippian church. Let your gentleness be evident to all. And he reminded the Colossian Christians, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And then he instructed the Galatians, just a few verses after the fruit of the Spirit that we read earlier. He says, brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently, gently. And so we see it over and over and over again. The first followers of Jesus, the church of Jesus, is to model the gentleness of Jesus. And you know, Paul spoke to uh, particularly ministry leaders, pastors, people that were going to be following in his footsteps. And, what, and in almost all the lists of the qualifications, gentleness is up there. I mean, very interesting that gentleness would be in a list of leadership qualities that we're to cultivate, especially in dealing with those that are outsiders or outside the church. Look what he says in 2 Timothy. He says, opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. That uh, reminds me of what I think Sheila was talking about earlier when we looked at kindness, how it's God's kindness, God's kindness towards us, God's gentleness, God's goodness towards us that actually breaks the hardness of our hearts. Um, not just his truth, not just those other aspects. And then lastly, Peter takes this on further. He says, First Peter, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. And so we could go on. There's more scriptures, but I think that's enough for now. What I really wanted you to feel there is just the emphasis that the first Christians, having experienced and seen it in Jesus' life, the emphasis on them and what you're doing, cultivate this characteristic of gentleness. And again, I don't know if we hear that often in our culture, in our time. Um, and, and in many ways, the, the world's gotten a bit harsher and cruel. And so gentleness really doesn't take much for it to really shine through and really be evident like that's different in your life. And so let's now turn our attention to what us and gentleness looks like. As we've gone from seeing it in Jesus, as we've gone from the earliest Christians, you know, as they began to really live out uh, the lifestyle of Jesus, um, 2,000 plus years later, it's our turn. And how does it practically work itself out in our lives? But it, it cannot be more clear and without a doubt that you and I, and specifically the followers of Jesus, are called to embody His gentleness. Now, this, uh, this quote from Dallas Willard, I think, is, is good for us, not just on gentleness and everything that we've been looking at. Here's what he says. One does not develop courage without facing danger, patience without trials, wisdom without heart and brain-racking puzzles, endurance without suffering, or temperance and honesty without temptations. These are the very things we treasure most about people. Ask yourself if you would be willing to be devoid of all these virtues. If your answer is no then don't scorn the means of obtaining them. In other words, what he's saying is like, hey, if you want to grow in gentleness, if you want to grow in patience, you want to grow in joy, you want to grow in any of these virtues, don't be surprised if opportunities present themselves where you're going to have to exercise gentleness in the face of cruelty or harshness or roughness, or you're going to have to exercise patience in the, uh, the opportunity of impatience. And so let's not despise those opportunities because it's trying to produce something within us. It's trying to exercise something in us. Why do we need gentleness? Well, I think gentleness is needed because life isn't perfect. And you and I every day are confronted with both our own and others' imperfections, right? And um, we can respond to other people's imperfections. We can respond to our own imperfections in many different ways. And sometimes we can get uh, short with people. We can get very cruel with people, sarcastic, uh, passive aggressiveness. These are all ways that harshness can come out. Harshness doesn't have to be just blunt, too. I mean, we can get blunt as well. Um, you know, you think about my life, think about your life, think about the roles that you occupy, how gentleness or roughness are different responses you can have as a parent to children, as um, a co-worker, employers in your, in your office, maybe people at school or campus, what about your own family, your own friends, even your own church community? There's plenty of opportunity uh, for people to provoke something in you. And does gentleness or harshness come out? 
And so this is the challenge for us. You know, if you think back uh, some of my days, like there's been times where I, I think, wow, that was a really harsh way I responded to my children. And if I could take it back, I'd want to respond in a different way. Or that was a really harsh way that I uh, responded to this person and that institute. And, or, or for me, it's, it's sarcasm. It can sometimes come out as well. Passive aggressiveness. And these are ways that don't model the gentleness of Christ. Um, and, 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 and really don't serve the situation. I know in the moment it feels maybe good, but the reality is it's just going to bear fruit that it's just going to work against you in that situation anyway. And so again, gentleness, that posture, not just of meekness and humility, but it's a posture of seeing people as image bearers of God. Who, that's who they are. They're, they're image, they have dignity and value. And this is, this is why Jesus was so profound in his ministry. Because he saw people for who they truly were, uh, precious in the sight of God, broken. Um, but here's the amazing thing with Jesus. Our brokenness, our failings, and our sin didn't repel him. It's what compelled him towards us. You know, if you're sitting there and you're very acutely aware of your failings, your sinfulness, and you can have an idea, again, a concept that God is too aloof and distant and disappointed, and it repels, your lifestyle repels him. I think in Jesus and the Genesis, we see the opposite. Uh, we see because of our brokenness, because of our sinfulness, because of our failings, he's compelled towards us. He wants to help us, actually. And this gentleness comes in and wants to make us new. And so gentleness is that posture of being able to see people as God sees them, to see people as people for whom Christ loves and died for. And, and when we're able to see that, we're, our disposition and our actions towards them can change. Um, we can begin to stop short of being harsh with them or cruel with them. Um, even if it's in a situation where we do need to confront uh, one another. And so, uh, based on those New Testament exhortations that we look through, based upon the life of Jesus and just that he introduces himself as lowly and humble in heart, and as we embrace this posture and way of behaving, let's look at some very practical considerations. How does gentleness outwork in your life, even today, maybe this coming week? Um, and so, here's uh, just a few ways... More ways, obviously, but a few non-exhaustive lists, but a few ways that I can see just based upon the scriptures, just based upon practical scenarios that might present themselves to you. Um, and let's go through them pretty quickly. Firstly, consideration. There's that word consideration, that we would have consideration for one another. You know, one another, it repeats itself so many times. Bear with one another. Be considerate of one another. You know, practically, you know, like if you're in a small group, you know, turn up to that small group. Um, and that's considerate of other people's time. It's considerate that your presence matters, your absence matters. Um, be considerate with other people as you listen to them. You know, nowadays it's, it's very just being fully present when someone's speaking to you is such a gift, right? You've been in those conversations. Maybe I've been in those conversations with you, and I apologize if you felt like this, but you've been in those conversations with people where you know that they're standing in front of you and they might be nodding, but you can see that their brain is thinking about something else or they're distracted with something else. Consideration for another means we're locked in. I'm right here, right now. I feel like Jesus would be fully engaged with you. Uh, if you were one of those people that came up to him in his life and ministry, I don't think you would find a Jesus that would be distracted or be like, yeah, yeah, just quickly tell me what you want and we need to move on. And so it's attentiveness, it's thoughtfulness, it's bearing with one another. Secondly, confrontation with one another. Gentleness isn't weakness. Gentleness does, it's just a posture in a way that we, but confrontation is absolutely vital in your life. If we're going to grow, Jesus confronted people of his day. He confronted his disciples. Why would we think anything different? It's a healthy form of love for one another. But we can confront with gentleness or harshness. And so in confrontation with one another, we're confronting difficult issues or behaviors in a way that allows it to be received as a restorative expression of love and care. You know, Galatians 6 talked about if, you, if someone's struggling with sin, you catch them in sin, restore them gently, right? Versus restoring them harshly or being harsh in that situation. That verse actually goes on to say, lest you yourself be tempted and you fall, right? It's like it's having a, a good estimation that, hey, but for the grace of God, there goes you as well. Like you're in no position or posture of superiority over another. But we don't ignore sinful behavior. We don't ignore sinful characteristics that we see in one another. We call it out in a gentleness spirit, and a spirit of gentleness. 
Thirdly, in communication, especially with those that don't believe what we believe, especially with people that don't follow Jesus in the way that you and I follow Jesus. Communing, what does gentleness look like in communicating with them? It's disarming. It's considering the best and most loving way to communicate that truth. It's not coming from a place of arrogance. It's not coming from a place of like, you're wrong, I'm right. Even though you might have a conviction, it's good for you to have convictions. But gentleness thinks, considers the person in front of them and considers how best would it be for me to communicate even hard truths to this person. Fourthly, gentleness looks like restraint. If you have any area of leadership or authority, think about the home. Think about uh, your workplace. Think about at school or campus. Um, think about in your church community. If there's any area that your role requires you to exert leadership or authority, that we do that with restraint. We don't overbear. We don't overuse our power. We keep our power under control. It's measured. We don't. Uh, we don't. We don't. We're not overbearing. You know, with our kids. We're not overbearing with our spouse. We're not overbearing in our position of leadership and authority. In fact, we're to come in a spirit of serving those that we have the responsibility to lead and have authority over. Fifthly, that we're just approachable and teachable, that we have a, the gentleness, uh, a posture of gentleness, meekness, and humility in us makes me teachable before God ultimately, but before other people. Makes me approachable, that you're a person that's approachable. You're approachable to receive encouragement, to receive care, to receive correction, to receive feedback, to receive challenge. And then lastly, gentleness obviously looks like care and concern, especially for the most vulnerable and marginalized among us. And there's plenty of opportunity, and we're just seeing more and more opportunity in our world as, as we see world, parts of our world that are incredibly cruel and harsh that are causing people to flee their homes and countries as Canadians and Canada welcomes in refugees. These are practical ways that we can demonstrate the gentleness and the kindness and the goodness and the love of Jesus. Obviously, that is not exhaustive, but those are ways that you can begin to think about how is this going to be outworked in my life, even this coming week. And so I want to close by coming back full circle what I was talking about. Now, you can go ahead and try those things, um, but it's so much easier to ha exercise gentleness towards others when you have genuinely experienced and tasted the gentleness of Jesus towards you. And so I want to come back to the words of Jesus, and I want to invite you into the invitation that Christ himself is putting before you and call upon you to respond. Uh, an invitation demands response, and it's a worthy invitation that demands a worthy response of you and my life. Jesus says it like this, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So the invitation is to come to Jesus. Maybe for the very first time, that's for you today. Maybe for the hundredth time, that's for you today. That we come to Jesus. That we receive his rest. That we receive his gentleness and his humility towards us. I mean, here is the king of all kings that is waiting upon us. That is serving us that we learn from Him, that we have a teachableness about us, that we learn from Him in His ways, that we walk in His ways, and that as you receive, as I receive that, that, that we go and do likewise, that we can be an extension of the gentleness and the humility of Jesus to others and be that extension. And so I want to call upon you to respond to Him today. And it's simply just bringing your life before Him. Are you, are you weary? Are you overburdened by sin? Or maybe you wouldn't label it like that, whatever it is, but are you, do you feel in your soul that there's a rest that Jesus offers you and I that will satisfy that no vacation would ever satisfy? And so take that invitation upon him. Upon your, take his invitation upon yourself. Uh, draw close to him. His gentleness is wooing you to him today. And so and as we do that, as we simply just open our lives, and Lord, here I am, that we uh, have a posture, that we have a posture of our humility, that we're going to learn from him. That we can't say we want the life of Jesus, but not practice the lifestyle of Jesus. They're both one and the same. The life of Jesus comes also as we begin to practice the lifestyle of Jesus. And so I'm going to lead us in a quick prayer and, um, and invite you to do that today. And then um, give a very practical way that you can also respond. And so Father, I pray for those watching right now. Pray for those that may be catching this later. 
Jesus, we thank you for the invitation. We thank you that you are gentle and humble in heart, that you invite us to come to you to receive your rest, uh, to receive the rest from sin, to receive the rest from the things that would tear apart at our souls. Um, God, that we'd receive your rest, that we'd learn from you, that we'd walk in your ways, God. And I pray today uh, for people that may be watching that need that rest, God. Would they encounter your gentleness? Would they encounter your rest? Would they encounter your life? Uh, giving invitation today in ways that changes them, transforms them like only you can. And then, Lord, would you make us examples and models of your gentleness to others, maybe in the workplace, maybe even at home, maybe in some difficult situations that we might walk in this week. Would we be able to practice the gentleness of Jesus as we've received the gentleness of Jesus towards us? We ask this in your name. Amen.